Good afternoon. Thank y'all for coming to join us today. Uh, my name is Amanda McMillan. I'm the Associate Director of Museum Programs here at the Historic New Orleans Collection. Uh, thank you for coming down to the French Quarter on a busy Saturday. Um, I, this program that we're doing today is part of a series of programs related to our Founding Era exhibition, which is currently on display upstairs in the History Gallery. And I just want to say, if any of y'all haven't had a chance to see it yet, I hope you'll walk upstairs today and check it out, because it's only uh, going to be available until May 27th. Uh, also, if you have anybody else that you know that hasn't seen it yet, please tell them, encourage them to come by and see it. So today we're delighted to have Dr. Eddie Boyd uh, join us today to talk about African American herbal remedy traditions. Uh, we stole him away from Destrehan Plantation, where he has been volunteering for the past 15 years. At least. Yeah. At least, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> doing this presentation there. We're delighted that he came and joined us today. Uh, Dr. Boyd was on the faculty of the University of Mis Michigan's College of Pharmacology for many, many years. Uh, and um, he grew up in some of these traditions, I believe, and then went on to study some of them uh, as part of his uh, career. So I, without further ado, I will turn the podium over to him. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. You guys hear me in the rear? I used to always start my presentations out by saying, uh, if you have a problem understanding my Mississippi accent, raise your hand, okay? <laughs> but finally, my students stopped and got tired of that corny uh, introduction. But anyway, uh, what I want to do is talk about herbal remedies, home remedies. And uh, I grew up in the cotton fields of central Mississippi, as Amanda said. I'm a 12th kid, 13 children, absolutely no money. No health insurance, no money to go to doctors, whatever. So whenever you talk about Herbal remedies, African American herbal remedies, home remedies, I've taken at least 60% of them, whatever you want to talk about, okay? Without uh, coal oil, which is kerosene, I learned kerosene when I was at, working my way through the doctor pharmacy program at the University of California, because it had been coal oil all my life, but without that, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you, because all of our water was contaminated. So whenever we had a foot injury, stepped on a nail, cut our feet, or what have you, wash the wound out, a month or so you apply kerosene to it, it allows it to heal. I used to have four, uh, two four inch scars on the bottom of my left foot where I stepped on some glass as a child. Now I'm at the point in my life where I go to a podiatrist every two months to get my toenails cut. And I, I used to look at the four inch scars before, whenever I pulled my shoes off. Now to find the scars I actually have to feel my foot. That's how well the kerosene actually allowed my foot to heal without becoming infected. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, three studies that we did at Michigan that uh, I was actually involved with, and then I want to talk about some of the specific remedies that uh, I've actually taken and worked with uh, throughout the years. But when I think in terms of why we actually use home remedies, we use them because what happens if there's something wrong with you, you try to treat yourself. So I think what 78, 79 percent of the time, when there's something wrong with you, you use, either use something that you've tried before, something that you've gotten from a doctor, except except the self treatment is the natural thing that you actually do. And we had no organized uh, health care to go to. We had no money to pay for whatever we actually uh, needed. But there was actually no health insurance, nothing like that. So whenever you were, didn't feel well or what have you. The remedies came out, okay? The other uh, time they came out was whenever there were certain times a year that you needed to do things to prevent the kids from getting sick. So that spring tonic, you know, everything from salt and molasses to castor oil and coffee, I've had them all, okay? <laughs> but anyway, then there were other things like uh, lack of transportation and, of course, lack of money. And then another uh, factor that probably played a big part was that we uh, were very, very religious people. We believed that uh, you try to heal yourself, et cetera, et cetera. In the second study we did at Michigan, I will point out some of the facts uh, that uh, sort of supports that uh, theory. But, but in a way, at Michigan, we did three studies. And the first study we did, we were actually just trying to document what was being taken, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea for the study 
originated from one of my former students who actually was a pharmacist. He worked for a small chain of drugstores in and around the city of Detroit. And what happened is that he, as he rotated, he'd rotate from one pharmacy to the other whenever someone called in sick or what have you. So he was all over the city of Detroit. And uh, he encountered people in all types of neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. But he noticed that when he rotated through the African-American neighborhoods, he would encounter people who worked for Chrysler, Ford, General Motors. They had relatively good, high and paying jobs. They had tremendous health care including basically free prescriptions. But instead of getting their prescriptions filled and taking their drugs as prescribed, they come into the drugstore and buy all kinds of stuff that he'd never seen in pharmacy school. You know, so he got so frustrated until one day he called me up and asked me if he could come out to Ann Arbor and take me to lunch. And I said, if you know, you're buying, I'm eating. So <laughs> poor professor, you better believe it, okay? But anyway, after he paid for the lunch that I ate, then he chewed me out because I didn't teach him about all the remedies, et cetera, that he'd encountered in practice. And what happened when I interviewed for the job at Michigan, they had a faculty committee that interviewed me, and they had a student committee. And he chaired the student committee, so he knew about my background. He knew that I knew about the remedies, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, my response to him was that you didn't believe half of the stuff I taught you from textbooks. So if I got up in the front, first of all, you've never seen anybody look like me standing in front of your class before. And if I got up there and started talking about remedies instead of what was in the textbooks, then you could have had me <coughs> fired, probably even hung, okay? But anyway, since there was nothing about these things in the medical uh, literature, we decided to try to generate some information primarily for use by healthcare practitioners. So we actually wrote a federal grant, National Institute of Aging, submitted it, and lo and behold, it got funded, okay? So once it got funded, we hired eight young people. We used videotaping and taught them how to interview people. And then we identified 50 old people who we knew used home remedies, or they were the people who had been identified in their neighborhoods as being knowledgeable about home remedies. And we actually sent our uh, interviewers out. They interviewed the people, the 50 people that we had actually identified collected information on 163 different things. And we actually used that information back in 1984 uh, and did our first publication, which is home remedy for the elderly. You may have actually seen this. But anyway, it's out of print now. But anyway, we published this in 1984. The federal government paid for this. And we handed it out to about 1,000 doctors licensed in southeastern Michigan just to give them some basic information about the remedies that their, some of their patients were actually taking. So we've been following this 163 uh, different things since 1984. Um, the study was done in 77, 78, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. But every six or seven years, we go back and forth to medical literature looking at those same remedies to see of the 163, how many we can find medical references that indicate they work, they don't work, et cetera, et cetera. And this is our latest book we published in 2014. And I can tell you roughly 20% uh, or so, I have about 299 references that indicate what works, what does not work. But anyway, um, a couple of comments about the first study we did as we got ready to uh, do our uh, survey on uh, home remedies, we, of course, you always want to make sure that if you are starting to ask someone if they use whatever, you want to make sure you're talking about the same thing, okay? So we, we went to the literature looking for a definition of home remedies. There was actually no definition of home remedies, which means that I had to create one, okay? So in your handout, you'll see my definition of home remedies. I call it a, a worker definition. Any substance that can be purchased without a prescription Obtained or has to be mixed, diluted, or dried prior to use by the patient. In this substance, and I give my favorite, a kerosene, coal oil, so we all know what we're talking about. It's used for purposes in a manner that's not prescribed on the label. And that includes gasoline, all of those things. You know, I can talk about things that uh, would uh, turn your stomach, which I'm not going to do. I don't want uh, you guys to leave and uh, make sure that. I don't get invited back, okay? <laughs> but anyway, once we actually created the definition, then we sent our interviewers out 
They interviewed the people, collected information on 163 different things, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those because some of them created some interesting conversations, okay? But anyway, uh, the demographic information for the first study, you know, most uh, anything would help with females, you are going to see it, I'm not bi, I'm not prejudiced, it's just women tend to be more care, they the caregivers and they um, will participate, at least in the past, they have participated more, uh, more so than males. You know, roughly 75% of uh, our uh, participants were female. And then the, uh, about half of them were married, the other 40% uh, or so was actually divorced. People were very, very religious. We, uh, most of them were Protestant. We did this uh, study in the Detroit area. But we did actually have one Catholic in the group, and we had uh, 49 of the people were actually from the United States. We actually had one person who was actually born and raised in Canada. He was, we were close to that Underground Railroad, so you get some strange things popping up, okay? People considered themselves to be very religious. Uh, three quarters of the respondents went to church at least once a week, and uh, all of them uh, pretty much uh, <coughs> agreed that they were very religious. And then we asked them about, uh, do you have a favorite remedy? And your handout actually uh, lists the favorite remedies. The lemon and onion for chest colds. You, when you look at remedies, you always find lemon and uh, in terms of use uh, for the treat of uh, colds. Uh, then alcohol for arthritis. And the alcohol, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. Alcohol for arthritis. That's the rubbing alcohol, as we use. That's the isopropyl alcohol. That's not the ethanol, okay? And in fact, up until, I'm not sure it's still, I mean, it may still be labeled as rubbing alcohol. They look, check isopropyl sometime when you're in the drugstore. It's isopropyl alcohol, okay? It was rubbing alcohol. In fact, I uh, was so bad as a kid until my mom sent me to the cotton fields when I was five years old because I broke her favorite bed. The only new bedroom set she ever got. You know, I had, was, had me babysit my niece that was five years younger, so I was holding her in my arms, climbing up on the dresser, diving in the bed, and broke the bed. So she sent me to the cotton fields when I was five, and I used to wake up in the middle of the night with leg pain. And I would wake up crying in my, one of my, I had five older sisters that learned to spoil me, okay? They'd get up and rub my neck, uh, legs at night with rubbing alcohol. And I would go back to sleep. I don't know if they went back to sleep, but it was probably just the placebo effect of the fact that somebody I cared about was rubbing my legs, okay? But that's what that's actually referring to. Salt for bowel movements, peppermint for high blood pressure. Usually you see peppermint for stomach types of problems, for blood pressure, but you try everything, and we tried everything, and nothing worked. And there weren't very many effective drugs to treat high blood pressure until say mid 50s, uh, 60, 1960 or so. Sage T for um, bronchial and sinus conditions, I'm gonna talk about sage T later on. One of my favorites, Juniper Tar, uh, Vic Sav, that's a Vic's vapor rub, that almighty Vic, okay? But the interesting thing about Vic's, the last book we wrote, the last study we looked at, Vic's vapor rub has some therapeutic benefit for toenail fungus of all things, okay? <laughs> which was, um, was shock. nothing works for that, okay? But anyway, kerosene and sugar for cough, we we'll talk about that again, as I say, kerosene without kerosene or coal oil, I wouldn't be standing here. And my mom would take a teaspoonful of kerosene, and uh, a teaspoonful of sugar, pour kerosene over that me melted sugar, and give us that internally for cough, colds, or what have you. I do my talks at Destrahan every two weeks, and at least once a month. I get somebody around my age who used the kerosene <laughs> and sugar for cars, okay? Most young people are sort of horrified when <laughs> to tell them that, okay? 54% of the group had less than nine years of uh, formal education, but 20 of them did actually have a high school diploma. Social Security was the main source of income. This was in 1977, 78. Most of individuals earned about $3,000 a year which is not a lot of money, okay? At that time, uh, four people uh, received uh, $10,000 in the household income in 1977-78. For whites was 40,200, for African Americans was 24,175. But that sort of tells you uh, where the group was. Now I will come back and 
took a good look at some of these specific ingredients that the people talked about, you know, later on after I talked just a little bit about the second study that we did, and then the third study, I'm not going to say very much about that because I retired before we really got into uh, the, uh, a lot of the analysis for the third study. But the second study, we basically, we did a secondary analysis of the National Survey of Black Americans. Now this was a survey, national survey, 2,107 individuals, and they collected 1,500 pieces of information about everybody, okay? So to think of a data set that size 25 years ago, okay? And I didn't even know what happened. My co-author, the person I worked with, she was good friends to the person who was married to the director of that study, okay? So they used some of our questions on home remedies and herbal products that I didn't even know they used. And they collected information that sort of sit someplace for five years before I found out they actually had it. They did nothing with it. You know, so once I found out that they had this, uh, they, uh, because they asked basically two questions that we used. Did your family use home remedies when you were growing up? And, and if the answer to that question was yes, then the second question was, do you still use them? And when they asked the questions, 2,107 people in the study, 1,439 said yes. But the follow-up question was, do you still use them? That was only like 531 people answered yes to that, okay? But that's still sort of large data sets, okay? You know, so I was a little bit uh, disappointed that uh, I was a consultant before they actually did that study because just when you ask if your family used them and you respond yes to that, then you follow up with a question, do you still use them? What about people whose family did use them who have started to use them now? You miss all of those people because of the way the uh, survey was actually designed. You know, so uh, the, I think the, the data set is large enough that you, we received some valid information, but it could have been even better if they'd actually let me know that they were doing the study. But basically, and I say this not uh, criticizing my coworkers or what have you, but I actually designed all the studies that got them their jobs, so they were running the, the, the studies, okay? So I didn't, uh, you know, uh, they didn't consult me on that. But anyway, in this uh, second study, as I say, was 2,107 individuals. And it was a, individuals had to be at least 18 years old or older. But the survey itself, they sent people to your home, came into the house to interview you. And they actually, the survey was 118 pages. They had 342 questions wow. on the survey, okay? So they spent hours, you know, and, and they have actually been books, not just papers, but books written about the survey. But as I say, I took two questions from the survey and actually worked on them. I won't, uh, my wife is here someplace. She don't know how many hours I worked on because basically what happened when the uh, information was collected from that survey. We at the University of Michigan didn't have access to SPSS, SAS, the big uh, statistical uh, analysis uh, uh, programs, okay? So University of Michigan wrote their own statistical program called OSARIS. Now OSARIS was a good program, but OSARIS was both case and space sensitive. So if you wrote a program, like we would sit in our office, I'd write a program, submit it to the mainframe computer, because that was the only thing big enough to handle that data set. If I had an extra space in my design, it come back, it wouldn't work. It didn't tell me why. It didn't tell me where the space was. So I had to go back and re rewrite it again, okay? It was both case and space sensitive. And until we got permission to use SPSS, which is one of the big uh, data sets, you know, we couldn't do a lot of analysis, but we finally got um, the ability to use outside sources. And OSARIS is still there, designed by the University of Michigan, but it, did, it, it didn't work. And I, I spent at least uh, six or seven years working on trying to get that uh, to work. But anyway, we did, uh, we're able to um, analyze, uh, do an analysis on family use of home remedies and also individual use of home remedies. 
So with the family use, 1,439 respondents, and then 531 with individual use, that's large enough. I, I'm satisfied that that's large enough to give me some idea that uh, probably uh, what uh, we were doing makes sense, okay? And in your handout, now of course, when you're working with a data set like that, you know, both my uh, co-author and I had worked our way through University of Michigan's statistical, uh, pseudo public health statistics program and gotten statistics degrees, so, degrees. so we were actually came up with, if in your handout, you'll see the theoretical models that we came up with, okay? And as you look at that model, don't uh, think that I'm overly chauvinistic, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But we had been working with use of home remedies for years. So we put everything in the theoretical model that we thought may have an effect on home remedy use, both for the family and for the individuals, okay? So when you see my box in there that says, Female works outside of the home. It's not, my wife will tell you I'm probably the least biased person she knows, okay? But anyway, I thought uh, maybe two incomes may be more effective than one in terms of whether or not you use home remedies as a self treatment. If you had more money in the house, maybe you, you're more likely to go to an a organized health care practitioner, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, that's why we threw you know, that uh, in the model. So you have both the uh, theoretical models for family home remedy use and for individual home remedy use, okay? But those were, uh, I designed both of those and then my co-authors actually agreed with them and then we did logistical regression. But as I say, when you're working with 1,439 subjects or you're working with 531, you can actually do some uh, serious analysis. So, and of course you do bivariate analysis and if it shows that something is related, then you do multivariate analysis. That isolates everything else in the model and tells you whether that individual factor is having an effect, okay? So if you look at the um, results of the family home remedy use, uh, we had in the model fam income, family size, mother's education, fathers, on and on and on. I'm not gonna go through that. And then the individual uh, home remedy use, gender, age, uh, living with a grandparent, et cetera. The demographic information is actually listed in your handout. I'm not gonna go uh, through that, okay? But the significant variables are listed in table four in your handout. And parents' education was definitely a significant factor in terms of whether or not uh, individuals used home rent. Increased importance of it, uh, religion was important. You know, living with a, a grandparent when you were less than 16 years old was important. Rural residency when 16 years of age was important for family use, and also region uh, residency. And I'm gonna comment a little bit more on the region uh, residency uh, later on, because there were some games that the Census uh, Department played with us uh, as we were doing our analysis. You always wanna use some standard that nobody can argue with you that you pick the right thing to compare your data to, okay? So we used the U.S. Census, and then they changed their way of analyzing stuff right in the middle of our analysis, okay? But in terms of a uh, uh, parent's education level, both the mother and father's educational level was related to family home remedy use, but with the father having less than an 11th grade education was significant in terms of uh, home remedy use. The importance of religion was definitely important. Uh, living with a grandparent when less than 16 years of age, and I, I'm a firm believer that you know that's a lot of that information was passed on, you know, by people who you respected or what have you. Rural residency was important, and then the region of residency, and there was a little bit of a problem with the region of residency. A couple of problems. One is that up until 1974. The U.S. Census classified Washington, D.C., the state of Maryland, Delaware, and I think New Jersey as southern states. <laughs> okay? Now, explain that one to me, okay? 
But anyway, you know, so that, so your southern use when it was, it was high enough already, okay? But if you do that, then you come up with, but then they realize, you know, the, the, the problem with that, and then midway through between 1970 and 1980, about 74, 75, they changed it. They changed it, okay? So that sort of threw things off, okay? And then, because what we found, we expected to find high use in the southern region, okay? Well, that may be our bias, but that's, I mean, we grew our own plants or what have you down here. We treat ourselves, okay? But anyway, the, uh, we still had some problems until we started looking at where the trains came from and where they wound up, okay? Coming out of New Orleans, people migrate from New Orleans to Chicago. The other parts of Louisiana, sometimes they wind up in San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles. My wife and I used to go out to California for Thanksgiving, fly back for the Bio Classic, okay? We were always full of a plane of people coming to the Bio Classic from San Francisco, okay? So once we start looking at the trains out of, uh, out of uh, Mississippi, Chicago, Detroit, same with the trains out of uh, Alabama or what have you, you go to the East Coast, then you're going into Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera. We had a better understanding of what was going on once we started to look at the train routes, ex 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 sorry about that, et cetera. But anyway, uh, as I say, we saw some interesting things there, but the U.S. Census Department, as I say, when they changed their method of analyzing data, it actually sort of threw us for a loop, you know, for a while, okay? And then individual home remedy use. Now, we got some interesting things there, too with the uh, use was related to age, to gender. As I say, females tend to be the caregivers, and if that's chauvinistic, please forgive me, okay? But that's just uh, what I've seen over my years, including my 32 years of teaching my female students who were the best students I had, always, or what have you. That was just the way it was, okay? Uh, educational level was related. Living with a grandparent when less than 16 years old, and then regional residency, okay? But with age, what we found was that in the individual use, younger people were more frequently using home remedies than older people. The educational level, educated people were more likely to use than less educated people. And what had actually happened was that, you know, we got into the self-care movement, lack of trust, of medical care, et cetera, et cetera you know, that the pattern had actually changed. The other things that probably had an effect was that a lot of the poor people, you know, with uh, Medicaid, Medicare, excess Social Security, et cetera, start paying for medical care, you know, probably had an effect on uh, whether or not, you know, a person who was a young person, old person, was likely to get uh, medical care. If you're getting free medical care, you know, we tend to go get that, okay, regardless of what your age is, okay? But anyway, uh, so those are the uh, factors that were actually related. And then the third study, third study, I'm not gonna say a lot about it, other than what that was looking at, and we just started to get data in when I retired. But what we were concerned about, we did it with the uh, nurse, nurses, the Michigan Nurses Association, and nurse midwives in Michigan. And what we were looking at was the use of herbal products and home remedies by pregnant and lactating women because we were concerned about things that were potentially toxic, carcinogenic, et cetera, et cetera. See, when you look at the use of home remedies at that time, you know, the average, uh, the percentage would be about, 40, about t uh, 9 percent of the population, okay? But when you looked at pregnant and lactating women, it would go up to about 40 percent or so. You know, it was a significant jump, you know. So as a group, we were concerned that they may be taking something that they shouldn't be taking et cetera, et cetera. So that's why we decided to take a look at that. Now, basically, the data was just coming in when I retired. And when I retired, I left all of this stuff in Michigan. I had been commuting back to Michigan for 10 years. And when I retired, I said, goodbye, where are my golf clubs, OK? <laughs> and basically, that lasted for about four months or so until my wife decided that she had seen enough of me, OK, <laughs> and volunteered me to do, to do this bit at uh, Desperate Hands, so therefore, and at that time, I had to go recreate the wheel, okay? So that's basically <laughs> what happened, okay? Let me stop there. I want to go through 
some of the examples. Does anyone have a question about the studies that we did before I just sort of plunge into? Yes. Did you ask about their television and radio habits and how much they were influenced by advertising? Well, well that, oh, that, this study covered all of that. Oh. But we just, I, I, we only looked at the home remedy and with those questions, yeah, right. We didn't, we didn't deal with. But I just was wondering if people had homelessness in the home, if that was causing them to move away from the home uh, we, 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 we really didn't. I, I don't think so, but, but uh, we didn't look at it. We really didn't. And basically, when we came into using this data set, you know, there were people who were handling all of those, with the teller, whatever. You, know, you name it, we we'll looked at, okay? When you get to, you know, 1,500 and some piece of information, you got a lot of information yeah. there. But anyway, well, we really didn't, we just, uh, plus we were sort of getting a free ride, so <laughs> to be a little bit careful that you don't get kicked out. <laughs> but as I say, it's, it's, and it probably was done, because there have been books written about this study. They went from this, they went to Europe and did one, and they've been back. I think they've done another one in this country since that time, but as I say, I, I lost touch, okay. Other questions? If not, if not, let's take a quick look at some, and let me talk about some of my favorite uh, remedies. Before I get into uh, talking about those, now, I don't want to gross anybody out, okay? <laughs> a couple of things I want to tell you is that I grew up, you know, we did not have any electricity until I was uh, six years old, okay? And I lived, had not lived in a house with an indoor bathroom, <coughs> until I was 16, okay? So, you know, I can do some things, eat some things that sort of grosses my wife. She'll fix a salad for me, put it in the refrigerator. When I come home, before I eat it, I put it in the microwave, okay? <laughs> so we never, you know, had any, we never had any refrigeration, so I can't eat cold food, okay? We just, I mean, hey, that's just the way it is, okay? So she tells me that's one day something that I'm gonna eat is gonna kill me, okay? <laughs> but I have, you know, I won't tell you how long I've been here, but I've been here a long time. Okay? She, she don't allow me to tell you how long, okay? But alcohol, we talked earlier, the topical alcohol, that's rubbing alcohol. And I talked about when uh, I would wake up crying at night and my sisters would actually rub me down or what have you. Aloe vera, a lot of you guys are familiar with that, use for variance. And of course, that's the gel that's inside of the leaf or what have you. But did you know that the outside of the leaf, the green part of the leaf, was in laxatives until 2002. And it worked it as a laxative by irritating the GI tract. But it's so irritating until in 2002, the Food and Drug Administration made the manufacturers of laxatives take it out, okay? But it is, it does work as a laxative. Apple cider black eye arthritis, I love apple cider, but I'm not too sure how effective it is. I'm not saying it's not. You know, if it works for you, use it, okay? Baking soda. Big time, 14 uses for baking soda. I've been brushing my teeth with baking soda for a long time. I won't tell you how many years. When I joined uh, military, because when I graduated from high school, males had a military obligation. So I signed up at the Air Force. They took, sent me to basic training, gave me a $20 pay advance, and a list of things to go to the base store and buy. On that list was toothpaste. I didn't have a clue in terms of what the hell toothpaste was. Never heard of it. You dump a little same thing I did this morning, a little baking soda in the palm of your hand, wet your toothbrush. That's the way you clean your teeth, okay? Now, of course, I have some glean, uh, crest toothpaste in my bag, so when my young dentist get on my case about my <laughs> baking soda, I'm not lying when I tell I use crest this morning, okay? <laughs> After the appointment is over, I go back to my baking soda, okay? I've been using it for a long time, okay? Chamomile, <clears throat> I don't know that it actually works. Be careful if you use it for individuals who have allergies to daisy plants or what have you, can cause allergic types of reactions. I have no uh, information one way or the other that says that that works, okay? Corn starch for rashes. If you ever bought a diaper rash preparation like desitin or what have you, what you bought was corn starch. 80%, in fact, corn starch is such a good absorber until 8 to 10% of prescription and non-prescription 
ointments will be corn starch. <laughs> very, very good. Earwax, cold sores, fever, blisters, styes on your eyes. Now, it does work against the bacteria that causes styes on your eyes. But I was taught in pharmacy school that uh, fever blisters is a viral infection. So the earwax shouldn't work. But once Dr. Phil came on the market, and my wife tells me it does work, OK? So I don't argue with Dr. Phil, right? But it does work. It will work for the styes. But it's just, it shouldn't work for the cold sore, OK? Egg yolks, you got nine uses there. I couldn't find any <coughs> verification that, I'm not, that any of those work. Now, I'm not, and when I say I didn't find any verification, that doesn't mean they don't work, OK? So you always have to keep in mind that research, I mean, uh, research on drugs are based upon the ability to earn a profit. And you can't get a patent on egg yolk or any part of the egg. So nobody's going to do any research on it, OK? So simply because nobody does any research on it, that doesn't mean it didn't work. It's just that nobody, you can't get a patent, so nobody ever do any research. If it's, if it's something that you, if you're using it for a purpose, that there's not a prescription drug to treat, a uh, non-prescription drug, then the federal government will pay for the research. What they did with, what was, they did something with, uh, for, for catheters recently, the cram, cranberry, was it cranberry extract? Yeah, yeah, yeah right, yeah, that's because there was nothing to treat for females who had had the catheters removed. So the federal government paid for that, but they're not gonna pay for something if it's, if the, if, for any research if there's something to treat it. So they don't pay for it, so you, uh, you, have, you can't ignore the profit motive, okay? That's my point. So when I say I don't have studies, nobody's going to do any studies if you can't uh, earn money on it, OK? Garlic, big time, blurred vision, high blood pressure, worms. Up until a couple of years ago, uh, <laughs> lowering cholesterol was on that list, too. And uh, there are probably, what, a thousand studies or so that looked at garlic useful, decreased blood pressure, cholesterol, et cetera, et cetera. And basically, what the information did show was that if you chewed a clove of garlic per day, 50% of the people who did that would get about a 10% drop in their blood pressure. <coughs> but notice I say chew a clove per day because the active ingredient in garlic, it, last time I checked, was allicin, A-L-L-I-C-I-N. And that's what you can smell if a person eat garlic. So if you take a garlic capsule <laughs> that you can't smell garlic, I would bet that there's no money, no, no active ingredient. And keep in mind with non-prescription drugs, prescription drugs, the Food and Drug Administration controls what's in them. But with dietary supplements, I mean, you may get my shoe heel when you buy it, OK? There's no control over what goes, even what goes in them. You know, so unless if they actually cause harm, they're supposed to notify FDA within, what, 90 days last time I looked. Okay, but there's no control over, so whatever. I'm not saying they don't work. I'm saying that you be careful with them. Things like ginger, the latest thing, of course, ginger does work to treat uh, motion sickness, uh, nice and vomiting and associated with pregnancy, swimming, boat rides, et cetera, et cetera. There's some information that uh, ginger also is beneficial in certain arthritic conditions, too. You know, that's the latest information there. And then honey, of course, uh, works very well for cough. You know, some of the other things, there are questions about some information shows that work for asthma, other shows that it don't. And of course, Manuka honey out of New Zealand as an anti-infective is an effective um, preparation. And of course, Manuka honey is from the uh, tree, the bees that make the hives in the Manuka tree. And that honey does contain the peroxides and other chemicals that seems to be effective as an anti-infective or what have you. I think what in the, other parts of Australia was a tea tree. What's this? A different name. It's a different, different tree. Also, I think one of the trees of that type of tree grows in South Africa, too, I believe. There's a related tree that grows in South Africa. I like Quorhan, okay? I've been using that for, yeah. I've been, this was in cough <laughs> drops when I was a kid, okay? Now I have some in my bag that, and I've been had them now. I'm, I'm on the last two or three, and I've had them, been taking them for about three years, okay? <laughs> so when my peppermint and all the rest of that bit don't work when I'm trying to talking like this, then I get one of my whorehounds. 
and chop down on that, okay? So they're still working, okay? They sell them at the gift shop at the Destry Avenue Plantation where I talk, okay? So every once in a while I reach over and get a bag, okay? We talked about kerosene before, coal oil, kerosene. That's one of my big time favorites, okay? Leeches. People will use them to treat black eyes. Makes a whole lot of sense to me. You can zap in your eye, the lies black because blood escapes from the capillary right under the skin, okay? You put a hunger at least close to it, it's gonna zap on, suck five times its weight in blood, drop off, it'll eat again six months to a year later. That should clear up your black eye. Leeches big time use in medical practice. In fact, they used so many of them in this country until in 2008, Food and Drug Administration made them a medical device. They control them just like they control prescription drugs, narcotics, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lab back in South Carolina. I have some in my thing over there, some preserved ones, but uh, there's a lab back in South Carolina that sells live leeches to me in about 3,500 hospitals throughout the United States. They have my credit card numbers. I have their telephone number, so if I call them this afternoon, Tuesday morning, I'll have live leeches sitting on my front porch, okay? And they will charge me anywhere from $7 to $11 per leech. Big time use. Okay. Any hospital that does plastic or cosmetic surgery may or may not use leeches. When you start moving flesh around, breast implants, they said, they said the skin flaps, et cetera, sometimes they need to use them. My, I had my thyroid gland removed. My thyroid surgeon was a plastic surgeon, a very good one, okay? So one day I decided to have some fun with him. So I decided when I went in, when he came in to see me, so I asked him, I said, Dr. Daniels, do you still use leeches? He was sort of taken aback because he didn't know anything about my background. <laughs> I said, do you still use leeches? But anyway, uh, they do use them, yeah. In fact, the biggest use, now are there any nurses, physicians in the group? Okay. Now tell me if I'm wrong, okay, but the big use, the biggest use, the big use of them is that if I cut my finger off, if I cut my finger off, take it with me to the hospital, anything, finger, toe, ear, eyelash, anything with thin skin, once you reattach it, the arteries that bring blood to it develop three days before the veins do. So the arteries develop bring blood to the reattached appendage, but there are no, blood, no <laughs> veins that take the blood away, so gangrene sets in. So since 1985, when a, a, a surgeon at Harvard replaced the kiss, uh, reattached the kid's ear and used leeches, and it works pretty much 100% of the time, they've been using leeches frequently when they reattach things within skin, okay? Because what happens is that once you Sew the finger back on, artery develop, bring blood to the finger, there are no veins to take the blood away. So they let a hungry leech bite the appendage someplace beyond where they reattach it. Where the leech bites the finger, a drop of blood escapes from that spot every 10 minutes, 12 hours. They let another hungry leech bite it. We do that for three days, three days later you got veins. And that's why those surgeries actually work. And that's why they use, that's what a big use of leeches in the hospital is when they reattach fingers, toes, ears, eyelashes, anything within skin. Big time use, okay? Cow manure. After like foot problem, stepping, stepping right into a fresh pot. And I've actually used that, okay? Hey, I, I, I won't elaborate on that, okay? The uh, other thing, I'm, I have a baby sister that lives in San Francisco. She just made, she'll be 81, well, she just made 81. And she's been living in San Francisco since she was 16 years old, okay? And about three years ago, she called me up. She said, Ed, is it true that cow manure tea is good for arthritis? Okay, now cow manure tea, I have some cow manure sitting on my table, but that's taking the dried cow manure, boiling it, and drinking the decanter, okay? So she called me up. She said, Ed, is it true that cow manure tea is good for arthritis? I was so tempted to tell her yes and to, <laughs> and to, call, me, and to call me back after she used it, okay? <laughs> But it dawned on me, if I had told her yes, she would have used it. You know, and I never thought, see, I had five older sisters that helped my mom raise me and spoil me, okay? And I never thought I would get old enough that I wouldn't pull a joke on one of my older sisters, okay? But I didn't have the heart to tell her yes, because she definitely would have used it, okay? Olive oil, I love it on salads, but I don't have any proof that it works for anything. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't, yes. The sweet oil, I just, uh, my mom that's the same thing, though. Aerates. Yeah, it aerates. Yes. Yeah, so now, I still use it. You warm it up on a little spoon and pour it in the air and 
it, you know, that, well, that, well, actually, that, that makes sense, especially if you have some fluids in it. If you have water or something in there, it, makes, it would make sense that it would actually tie it up. It makes sense. I'm not saying it doesn't work. All I'm saying is that I, have, I couldn't find any studies to support it, is what I'm saying, okay? Now, pepper, uh, black pepper, I don't know, but red pepper works very, very well as a topical pain reliever, capsation from red pepper. In fact, it works so well until there's, what, four or five non-prescription drugs and at least one prescription drug on the, drug on the market that contains capsaicin from red pepper. And it's actually used you know, for patients with shingles. You know, even narcotics don't work that well for the pain associated with shingles. But the topical capsaicin preparations do work. You've got to use them for about eight days or so, keep them off, away from thin skin, uh, what have you. But you've got to use them and keep the, uh, for eight to 10 days or so to get a beneficial effect, but it does work, okay? Then peppermint, I like it for chest pains, et cetera, uh, stomach types of problems. Sage tea, uh, there's some information uh, that it may actually help decrease memory loss in some Alzheimer's patients, so take a look at that one if you need to use or something like that. It's, it's, always, it's also good for uh, women in menopause, right. Oh, okay. Yeah, actually, uh, da, 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 trying to see if that was on my on the list. It's not there. <laughs> and then my next one is salt solution. You 23 uses there. Big time. I use salt when I have a sore throat so bad that I actually can't sleep. I'll take boiling water, water almost boiling, dump salt in it, and then I'll gargle that. When you dump the salt in the water, it decreases the what? Is it freezing point or boiling point? I always get them mixed up but it decreases, it cools off, okay? And then you can actually gargle. I gargle with it, and it allows me to sleep or what have you. Then the other use I make of salt solution, 0.9% uh, salt solution, the Afrin, the nasal sprays, actually, if you use them more than three days, they tend to be addicting. Salt solution, I have information that indicates you can use that for 0.9% up to a year or so. You know, so that is uh, one of the uses I, I make for salt solutions, okay? Sassafras, anemia, some people swear by that. I don't have any uh, information one way or the other. And I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying I don't have any information one way or the other, okay? Then spearmint, again, not so much for chest pain. I have chest pain. I want to run you off to your cardiologist real quick, okay? <laughs> but, but any type of stomach problem, I would go with it, okay? And then spider webs, one of the handouts that I had given you to, to stop bleeding, okay? And the last handout, the one pager that you were actually given, you know, I want to use to sort of talk about one of my favorites, which is spider webs. I've been playing with spider webs to stop bleeding for the last couple of years or so. Uh, I had to have my thyroid gland removed, and before they do surgery on a person my age, they bring you to the hospital at least 10 times to stick you. And I don't like needles, okay? So I decided to have some fun with the phlebotomist. So on my way to the hospital to have my blood drawn, I stop in my garage, make, use a old golf club, make my spiders move around, collect some spider webs, put them in a Ziploc bag, take them with me to the hospital. First time I gave them to the phlebotomist, I said, now once you pull the needle out, you apply the spider webs. I will hold them while you tape them, okay? The first time she did it, it stopped the bleeding so quickly, I thought she was gonna pass out on me, okay? We did it five times, worked beautiful, okay? The sixth time we did it, it didn't work, okay? And I, what I changed the sixth time was instead of giving the phlebotomist the spider webs to apply, when she pulled the needle out, I applied the spider webs, and I don't think I did it quickly enough because I was worried about pushing the needle down into my arm, okay? So right now, I'm collecting spider webs. I've only used them on, and don't you guys do this. See, I can do this. I've been around a long time, okay? But, but I, I'm, I've only used them on puncture wounds. I'm going to use them on cuts. So I put them in my, all my bathrooms at home, so when I accidentally cut myself, I'm going to use them. Yes? I'm from here, from New Orleans, and my grandfather taught me about this. Right. And he said, because he took his shoes off in June and used to um, work for his grandfather, who, or great-grandfather, right. who had ships right. coming from, that would meet the ships coming by St. John right. to buy, buy, buy um, Mercy Hospital. And then they would 
had barges that were going to put all the stuff on barges. And Grandpa had cows. I think it was either cows or horse mules. But he was on the animal making it move. Right, we right. A child right. To, to get it to the end of the canal. And so he told me two things. One was the spider web. Right. I did it as a child and it works. Yeah, I mean, well, the other thing, I don't. I mean, you have to put a substantial amount on your whack your right. foot, you have a bleeding toe, but right. you put the spider web on it and you hold it and it's incredible. But when I went to Loyola, right. the Invest Technology, right, yeah. and in the blood bank um, course, the teacher told us right, yeah. that there's chemicals in. But, but I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use the diagram. I'm going to use the diagram to argue how it works. That's, that's why I gave you that one page. Of, I'm going to argue, I'm going to give you my theory on how it works, yes. So I had an interesting um, uh, family tale, I guess, is, is what it was. Uh, I'm from around Lake Charles, Cajun right. country, and there is a story about one of our relatives who apparently had some form of cancer, probably right. skin, and it started to eat away, and instead of going to the doctor, um, they had to stuff it with spider webs, right. and that's how they keep the infection out, and I guess right. um, keep it from... Yes, for bleeding, both the puncture as well as cut, you can use the very thin skin of an onion. I learned that from Mayans in the Yucatan, and it works so incredibly well. The thin skin of, of, of an onion. Oh, oh, between onion. The oh, onion. Between the layers. Between the layers. Right, okay. Really thin okay. One, you just put really it on really it thin. Thin. Oh, okay. it instantly stops, even fairly large cuts. Right. Oh, okay. Did I have a question now in front? Yes. Chronic note. Okay, so say the person gets out like during the allergy season and it gets really hot and they constantly have nose bleeds and they want to try to stop that. They've tried multiple things, including I, solutions. I would use it temporarily, but I wouldn't you know, if you keep if it keeps coming back again and again, then I, w I would I start to worry about self treatment of that. Okay, okay. Uh, well say that person has gone to doctors and all they've ever given them is clothes. And, I know and they can't do anything. And they can't do anything else. Well, they never recommend anything else. Right. Hey, then, 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 I would try to solve it, but that, I'm not going to. Don't, don't, I'm not going to tell you to do it. Okay. But as I say, I yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, in reflexology, you can actually work the the upper part of your thumb with massage the area. And if you have a nose bleed on the right, you would work the left thumb and vice versa. Just see them for a few minutes. I have done this and it worked, years yeah. ago with my little nephew. He used to have nose bleeds a lot. And it did stop it now. And that's not saying that we don't know what the cause is. You would have to let you me, know, look into it first. Let me get back to my spider webs a couple of <laughs> okay. yeah. Now, you, uh, you guys are big, much more into literature in English than I am, but the Shakespearean play, what is it, is it Miss Midsummer Night's Dream, okay? Richard Bottoms, the character, the weaver, when he cut his finger, was looking for spider webs to stop bleeding, and that play was written in what, 1560 or so? Okay, spider webs have been used to stop bleeding for centuries. I mean, really, for, yeah, oh yeah. And my theory on how it works with that handout that I gave you, what you're looking at, any physicians in the house? Yes, clotting cascade, right? If you look at the clotting cascade all the way down to fibrin, that is what your platelets actually stick to to stop you from bleeding. Fibrin is very, very similar to spider webs. Fibrin, once it forms, can stretch four times its length, come back to its original shape. Spider webs can stretch two and a half to length and come back to the original shape, okay? And I've given my argument that maybe the spider webs is substituted into the normal clotting process. And the reason I ask if there's a physician in the house because I've given my argument to 66 positions, okay? <laughs> I have one yet to tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about, which is possible, and if you know that I, I don't, then please 
you know, showed me something else. I taught anticoagulation to pharmacy students for 10 years. That was my last 10 years of lecture at Michigan, <laughs> okay. But anyway, uh, and then the other thing about spider webs that I want to mention, of course, spider webs are the strongest thing that have been encountered on this earth. If you take a strand of steel and a strand of a spider web that's the same size, this spider webs is six times stronger than the strand of steel. They're stronger than Kevlar that's been used for bullet, that's used for bulletproof vest. And that's why the federal government has been over the years investing big dollars in trying to come up with the method to mass produce spider webs because it would make great light armor for our policemen, you know, for our military people, et cetera, et cetera. And then Randy Lewis and his group, you may be familiar with him, he's out of, uh, I want to say, I believe one of the Canadian universities, because he left there, came when I first started reading about him. He was at the University of Wyoming for a number of years. And they took the genes of a spider and instilled them into goats. And once you breed the goat, every third female offspring would produce spider webs, fibers in her milk. The only problem is they, couldn't, they still couldn't get enough spider webs produced to commercialize the process. So they were actually injecting the genes of spiders into uh, alfalfa plants, because it works with plants, you know, too. And then Randy and his group left Wyoming and went to Utah State University. And the people at Utah State, they kept continuing their spider web research over there. The Navy gave them a huge grant because there are spiders that spawn their webs into water and catch fish, small fish. And most of the glues that the Navy have don't work in water. So they gave Randy and his group a big grant to actually try to come up with how do you figure out what it is about the spider webs that makes them work in water, et cetera, et cetera. But I usually try to update when I know that I'm going to talk to a group like you guys. You know, so last night I read Randy's name again, and he's now with a uh, tech group, and they got an LLC out of California, you know, because they are marketing all types of uh, spider web uh, types of uh, products. You know, they, they figured we'll be able to make artificial joints, you know, you name it. It goes on and on because, as I say, it's the strongest thing that have been encountered. I think bamboo and spider webs are the strongest thing that we've encountered on this earth, okay? So you may want to take a look, if you're interested in the spider webs, you may want to take a look at that. There's a lot more uh, information regarding, as I say, I just happened to look at some of my stuff and say, let me see what Randy and his group has been up to uh, lately. But anyway, so they are still dealing with their spider webs, their spider web research. And uh, it makes for an interesting, uh, you know, situation. Why don't I stop there? that you guys ask asking a question. Yeah, you had a question. Um, from your list, um, number three, the apple cider for arthritis. Mm -hmm. Number 25, the um, apple cider for the chest pain. Mm -hmm. dizziness, headache, et cetera. Would you recommend that be topical or taking oral? I, I, I love, <laughs> my bias is becoming to play. I love top, I love cider, so. Topical? No, 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 I would, I would. I, oh, I see. I do it. I do it internally. Okay. Although, but don't quote. I, I'll give you a card, and, and I'll let you email me your question. Okay. I'll get you the right. I can't get. I can't get apple cider past my glass on my table. Okay. <laughs> so I, I lived in Michigan 32 years, and they have some of the best cider in the country up there. So come fall, you know, that's what we've been. Doing. Yes. Was it lavender? It probably was lavender. Pardon? Lavender? Was it lavender? It was a lavender. Yeah, yeah okay, lavender. yeah, okay. Yeah. Color. But I've never seen it in the same Yeah. Well, Jennifer, that's a, that's a. I've never seen it in the States, but I've been It's an anti-Semitic disease. They, they use that's what, that's what. They, they have other drugs now, like consumers don't like the real estate. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, and in fact, in fact uh, when I was in the military in the Philippines, uh, they had a, a whole ward full of soldiers in the hospital with purple feet. <laughs> because gen gentle violet was what they were using for fungal infection. Yeah. Other feet, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. right. But they also look. Yeah, yeah, long time, they used, to, they used to, what, uh, uh, no, I'm thinking of something, I'm thinking of something, I'm thinking of something, I'm thinking of Indigo, yeah, yes. Do you, do you do any collaboration or work with any of the local uh, creatures? I, I don't, I try my best not to do very much, okay? okay. I mean, <laughs> I, I work from five to six to five, okay, so I try my, I, I do, um, a presentation, a whole demonstration of sitting behind the table talking about my products uh, every other Friday. And then with uh, one of our books is still selling, so when the Diamond Tour Buses come in to Destrian Plantation, we sell books. I do book signings at least once a week. But other than that, I try my best to just sort of coast out of here. No, no. I just, when I retired, I retired, okay. Yeah. Yes? Um, down here, say I want to go to school for illness. What would be the best major for me to pick? Because I want something that incorporates both modern medicine and botany. Of course, of course. I'm biased, so you don't ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pharmacist, okay? So, so don't ask me that question. Because you know I'm going to give you a biased answer, okay? okay. Emily. When you say a, 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 the American Indians, well, actually, well, you always have about a 65 percent overlap, regardless of what group. When you go from one group to the other, we all how all have our own remedies, but regardless of what group you're looking at, you always have about a 65 percent overlap. Like, for instance, when we were doing our latest book, okay, I was dumbing through, um, you know, I'm googling something all the time, but I ran across a study. It was done by, it was uh, 10 surveys of females in Saskatchewan, the things that they used. And the title of the survey was flaxseed, goose grease, and gunpowder. So my question is, who in the hell know anything about goose grease other than me? So I went back and looked at it, and it was, uh, t it was a result of 10 surveys done in Saskatchewan between uh, 1892 in 1914, and when I looked at what they had, uh, what they were using, and what we had in our book, we had a 64.8% uh, overlap. You know, when I started looking at things you use when you are uh, cutting wood and cut chapter foot with an axe, I'm saying, I've been there, okay, so I, whatever. But anyway, so you always have a, a, an, an overlap from one group to the other, so you pick any group you will find uh, things, you, a lot of times the group, the uh, products themselves would be sort of specific to the problems that are common in the group. Like for instance, if you pick a group where you have diabetes as a common occurrence, then you'll find more things to treat diabetes. But we always have about a 64% overlap. Yes? You um, refer to the items on the table as your products. Do you sell these? I don't, I don't, no. I don't, <laughs> I don't sell them. I, the only thing I sell is books, uh, other than the books. And you know, we wrote our book uh, for informational purposes. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't write. We didn't write the book for treatment. So, you know, I don't want to be accused of practicing medicine with no license. Okay, so, so basically, we're just trying to provide information to people who are, are curious. It's what we we're trying to do. Yeah. But other than that, no, I've been. In fact, I've had former students who years ago, who tried to get me to go into. Uh, business with them when the aromatic oils were first becoming popular. Those people are, are millionaires now. But I just simply couldn't. I can, I always had a real problem with being honest. You know, so I can, I'm fine as long as I believe in what I'm telling you. But, but if I got to tell you a lie to sell you something, I'll starve to death, okay? That's just the way it is. I'm sorry, but that's the way my mom raised me, okay? Yes. 
have a question. When you step on a rusty nail, my grandmother would put some fat meat. Yes. Salt. Did you ever study the salt? Study well, the salt, salt, the salt is going to bring the fluids out, and that brings the rust and the t t tetanus bacteria and anything else. That's how it would actually work, big time. Salt. Oh yeah. Salt pork. Oh yeah. Oh, look. Yes. What is your most um, common response to people who say that home remedies simply don't work or it's just easier to buy something off the shelf? What, what do you say to them? Well, it actually depends on what it is and what you're treating. You know, some of them work. Some of them work. I don't believe that, uh, you know, certain this one always works and that one don't. It depends. Something as simple as a headache and asthma. Well, say, well, hey, I, with headache, I go with aspirin, okay? I'm a big time user. Uh, but I also, I'm a big time user of, I use a lot of generic drugs. I use a lot of prescription drugs. I use some uh, home remedies. You know, I'm a big naproxen user because I, I'm at the point that arthritis will wipe me out for a day. Now, I will go to Walmart and uh, next to a leave, they have naproxen sodium. So I will buy napas and sodium, and I take double the dose that's on the bottle, because I know that the prescription dose is 500 milligrams. I will take that today. I'll have a problem with my muscles a month from now. So with my other 12 medications I take, I don't, at 7 o'clock in the morning, I take them all together. Been doing it for a lot of years, okay? But uh, I know that it's, I can get away with it, okay? But that's the way I do things. I use it, I sort of pick and choose depending upon what it is, what I need, et cetera, et cetera. I think you have good herbal products. I think you have good prescription products, good non-prescription products. But I'm lucky enough to sort of know how to pick and choose them. And I give uh, advice to anybody who asks me. I pass on your information whenever I request it yet. Other questions? Yes. When you conclude the presentation, can we look at your <coughs> items up there? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yes. I'm just curious, do you know anything about the mold? Yeah, it, it's, I don't think, I don't, I don't think it was covered in our, I don't, is it? <coughs> mullen, mullen leaves, et cetera, et cetera, commonly used, but don't, I'm drawing a blank, I'm trying to see if we, yeah, here. Uh, the, the, I think they, they may, if, if the gift shop don't have it, they probably can get it for you. I would think they probably, I don't know if they have they, but they, but I would order it through the uh, gift shop. And if they can't order it, you can always get it. They sell it through Amazon.com and also Barnes and Noble and also my publishers, uh, University of Louisiana Lafayette Press, out of uh, Lafayette. And what's the name of the book? It's uh, uh, African-American Home Remedies, oh. Practical Guide with usage and application data. Yes. I really, I've never used it. You know, I've never used it, although I think I would say my, my, my gut reaction would be, it's probably something that's okay. But, but as I say, I have never used it. I don't know if it wasn't common where I grew up or, or for whatever reason, but I don't, I've never used it. Oh, okay. I'm excited about my teas because I'm really not asthma. Okay. Um, also, if you smoke weed, you can actually use it as a filler in your weed so that way it's the burning feeling from your bowl. It doesn't hurt as bad for people who have asthma. So it's no Other questions? <laughs> If not, thank you guys. Thanks for toler tolerating my Mississippi accent. Call me with your, your Mullen question. Email me with your Mullen question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs>
Oh, yes, sir. I'm so short <laughs> that I go to like I go to weddings. I sit in the front row. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't see the wedding. There you go. Hi, others. 